an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world. Wow. To be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. To the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord. Be well, before we get into the word, I just want to again say what I said last week as I get started. If you're not in a small group, you can call it whatever you want. Some people call it a life group. Some people call it a discipleship group. There's all different names, but it's really the same thing. It's a place where we do what the women just talked about, what the women just did on retreat, where we get together, we share our lives honestly, openly, in a place of safety so that we can then open the word, we open our lives so we can pray for each other week to week, and it goes right back to the early church. It's what the early church did. When you look in the book of Acts, they shared their lives with each other. They supported each other. They were accountable to each other. We all need this. That was the point of growth for me as a young man when I first came to faith, was when I came to understand what the church was really meant to be. It's a community. It's a family. So I encourage you to go, if you're not in a small group, go out to the small group table right after the service, get in a small group, put your name down, say, I want to be in a group, and we'll make sure we get you into one, because starting this week, you're going to be breaking down what I'm talking about in my message, and I'll be doing that each week in the book of Ephesians. So really encourage you to do that. And what I want to do now is I want to pray for us. Let's pray. Loving God, thank you for this time together in your presence. Thank you that you are speaking to us because you are alive through Christ in your spirit. And Lord, if we've given you our lives, your spirit lives in us, and you, you definitely are wanting us to hear something from you today. And if we haven't come to a place of giving you our lives, I would guess that your spirit is wooing us and seeking to draw us to yourself, you the only one who can give us what our hearts long for. So God, give us the capacity to hear and to listen, respond to your loving invitations in this time through your living word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So what we're going to do is we're going to break this down verse by verse. And so we're just going to see, there's going to be a slide for every verse. 
Uh, you may like to bring your Bible, and I like to write in my Bible. I like to, I'm still kind of old school. I like to hold on to something like this. It's more tactile. Uh, it's more sensual in a sense. Uh, I like that. You may like having a phone or a tablet or whatever. Whatever works for you, but you just want to have it, and that's why we have it on the screens to make it easy. Uh, before we get into the passage, though, <clears throat> I have a confession to make. And that is, um, one of my weaknesses is when I'm passionate about something, I tend to repeat myself. How many of you have that same tendency? Yeah. When we care about something, we really want people to hear us and receive what's important to us. And if we get any sense that they're not paying attention, we say it again. Somehow we think if I say it two or three or five times, maybe they'll hear me. Or maybe it's just the other person really isn't listening. I don't know, but that's a natural tendency. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul is doing in this passage. You'll notice when we go through this passage, it's like, it's like waves on the shore. He's just saying a lot of the same things over, using different words, because he wants to make sure that hit the people he was writing, these believers in the region of Ephesus, it wasn't just the town. It was that whole region in, in that part of the ancient world, the Roman world at this time in the first century, where there were Christians. Christians in that region, in the city of Ephesus, but around that great center, that great uh, cultural center at that time in the first century. So he wants to make sure people understand this truth of what's available to all of us in Christ. And so with that in mind, I want you to be paying attention for what you notice, what Paul is really passionately trying to make sure we don't, we don't miss, okay? So let's, let's look at this together. Ephesians chapter 1. So here we go, verse 1. Paul, an apostle by, of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Paul starts with his official designation. He's using a title that he uses every time he writes. If you read his other letters, you'll see this is a title he uses. And he does that because he wants to make sure that people know that what he's saying, it's kind of like what Diane said earlier about how God used her at the retreat. He's saying, this is a calling that God Almighty has given me. That's why he says, by the will of God. And so he's not, what he's saying, everything he says in this letter is literally a word from God to these people, and through this, to us, to all people, to all the world. And then when he says to God's holy people in this area, in Ephesus, the faithful, that word holy, we just sing that, you know, this is holy ground, we're to be holy people, it's, and it says it later in the passage, what we are to become in Christ. That word simply means set apart from. You've probably heard that before. That's the literal translation of holy, set apart from something. In this case, it's being set apart from what we call sin, what the Bible calls sin. It's any thought, attitude, behavior that's not of God. And so what holiness is, it's about becoming truly set free from everything that's not of God. How many want that? I want that. I want more of that. I've experienced a lot of that in my life up until now by the grace of God and the work of the Spirit, and God helping me honestly face the things in myself, thoughts, attitudes, behaviors, that are not of God, that oppress me, that, that keep me from experiencing the gifts of God, the riches of God, all the things that Paul's talking about in this passage that we're going to get to. That's what holiness is. It's just, it's being set free. Freedom in Christ from everything that oppresses us. And so God's holy people, and it says the faithful. Now we can misinterpret this, for, this word faithful. We can, it can, it can sound like it's about our performance. It's about us being faithful to God. That's not the meaning of this word. This word means the faith-filled ones. 
the ones who have faith in everything Paul's going to say here that God makes possible in Christ. We believe in what God's done for us in Jesus. And so because of our belief in what God has accomplished for us in Christ, we become the set free ones. Does that make sense? We become set free because we believe and we receive, and we're going to see this in the passage in a moment, what God has done for us in Christ. So it's not about our performance. It's about our belief, our trust in God. So God can do in our lives what we can't do for ourselves. That's the gospel. And then he says, grace, verse 2, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And these two words, grace, that's the source of all the gifts of God. Grace. And we're going to see this said many ways. Grace, the grace of God. It's the essence of our faith. Grace is the source. Peace is the outcome. We all want peace. But do we really open ourselves to the move of God? The will of God. And that's why Paul is saying this is all about the will of God. It's about opening ourselves to the goodness of all that God has for us, believing in that, receiving that, and being transformed by that. That's what Lent is all about, by the way. You know, as Diane said, I hope you come and join us for Ash Wednesday. You know, I asked, you guys have an Ash Wednesday service? When I've been here two weeks. And, and they said, you know what? We really haven't done an Ash Wednesday service. I said, we're going to do an Ash Wednesday service. Because this is really important, especially in a season like this, in a church like this. You guys are in a time of major discernment. You have to hear what God is saying. We can't hear what God is saying if we're not willing to listen. And so Lent is all about listening. It's all about stopping and just getting in touch with what's going on inside of us and bringing that to God and then like God in meeting, meeting us in that place. You have this great resource out here right behind the sanctuary. I couldn't, the first time I came on this property, I couldn't believe you had a labyrinth on your property. And, and that's when I was meeting with a committee that was talking with me about the possibility of me coming and being your interim. And I was, walk, I was prayerfully walking the labyrinth because the labyrinth, what it does is it slows you down. That's what it does. You can't walk a labyrinth fast. I mean, try it. You'll fall over because it goes like this. And so all you, what it forces you to do, it forces you to be present each step of the way. It brings your, it's an embodied form of prayer that helps you stop and get in touch with what's really going on inside of you. And by the time you get to the middle, whatever you've had inside of you, now I'm really aware of it, and I leave it with God in the center of the labyrinth. I trust that to God. And then as I walk slowly, don't sprint across the labyrinth at that point. Walk back out, because now, by the time you prayerfully walk out, by the time you walk out and you walk back to your car, you've experienced freedom. You've experienced liberation by the power of God. But see, we only experience that freedom, that holiness, to the extent that we will get in touch with that which is true and real in us. And that's what Lent's all about. It's about listening and then letting God meet us so God can free us and God can guide us into something better. And that's what, so by the time we get to Easter, we can really celebrate all the gifts we've received through those 40 days of Lent. So don't miss out on this. Come, make time for it. I realize it's Valentine's Day, but you might want to think about how can you make that part of your day of love? I mean, God is our primary lover, right? So it starts with God, and then it's each other, and then it goes out from there. So let's go on. So it's about our faith in Christ. Now, this next verse, verse 3. This is really the main point of the message. It's about grace. All of this is God's doing. But this first phrase, it says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he ends the section by saying, To the praise of his glory. And two other times, he repeats that same phrase, to the praise of God's glory. And so that is really the main point today, that we are here on earth. We've been placed on this earth, our eternal destiny, the, re, the why, like on the cover of your bullet. Why are we here? We're here. We've been created 
to experience relationship with God so that then we can become fully who we were intended to be, so then we can do what we were created most to do, which is to bring glory to God by how we live our lives. All that we do, how we use our money, how we use our time, what we do with all the talents and gifts God's given us, as we experience more the freedom of God through the gifts of God, it all circles back to God. And we become a living testimony to God's work in our life so that others outside who are still lost, who are still oppressed, who still have not experienced the goodness of God in Christ, they experience that in and through us. We become the living embodiment of the transforming work of Christ. And so it's about all about bringing praise and glory to God. So he says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. That just simply means everything that is in Christ now in his resurrected, glorified state is yours if you're a believer. Everything that's available to Christ in his glorified state because he's done what we're celebrating in communion He's died for the sin of the world. It's done. He said on the cross, it's finished. And as we walk into, that's what we're seeking to live into more, is the fullness of the life and the freedom we have in Christ. And so that's available. All those spiritual riches are available to, to us in Christ. And then verse 4, he says, and this is all about God's grace. It's all God's doing. It's not our doing. It says he chose us. That's a passive word in the Greek. It means it's done to us. We did nothing to deserve our, our standing before God and God naming us from before eternity and saying, that one's mine. That one's going to be mine. This is what you call covenant theology. It's reformed theology. It's what it means to be Presbyterian or any covenant reformed theology that we're part of, our Presbyterian tradition is part of. It comes from this. That God does it. That's why at a, at a baptism of a baby, we're saying, we're saying this baby now, we're recognizing that God knew this child before this child was ever born, and this child is now held in the hand of God. It's not because of anything this child will ever do. It's because of what God has already done and what God will do that this child, by the grace of God and the work of the Spirit, will respond to one day when they come to faith. God does it all. We just simply respond if, we're, if, we're, if God enables us and opens us to respond. And so God chose us. It says, in him before the creation of the world, to be holy, to be set free, to be blameless, to be free from everything that's not of him in his sight. And notice what it says next. And that's why it's part of this verse. It says, to be holy and blameless in his sight in what? In what? In what? Are you with me? In love. That should be our distinguishing characteristic as Christians. That we embody a life of love. If we are not doing that, we're not representing Christ. And what's sad is most people outside the church don't want to have anything to do with the church because most people look at Christians as angry and judgmental. I don't want to be known that way. I want to be known as somebody who's a lover of people because God is the greatest lover of all. And as we get to know God, we should become like God. We should be freed of the things that make us bitter and angry and judgmental and critical and unforgiving and all those things that have nothing to do with God. So it's all to be done in love. And notice the next verse, verse 5, he says, He predestined us. Again, it's all God's doing. There's that repetition. There goes Paul. God made it possible. He predestined us. He, for adoption, and Paul's just taking a word from the Greco-Roman world, adoption, where a wealthy, powerful person who didn't have a child, didn't have an heir, they would, they would take one of their slaves in their household, and they would say, you're now my child, I adopt you, and I take you from slavery, and I make you now a full member of my household. That's what God does for us in Christ. God takes us out of slavery, out of our sin. He says, I name you, you're my child. Come and be part of my family. And that's what Paul says. Adoption for sonship or daughtership 
through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure. See, God loves doing this. God loves you. God loves me. God wants, it gives God pleasure when we respond to his invitations. And it's all, there's that phrase, to the praise of his glorious grace. That's the second time, which he's freely given us in the one he loves. Verse 7, in Jesus, now he gets specific. What are the gifts we have? Redemption. Redemption is taken right out of the Old Testament theology. Old Testament theology teaches, when you look at the story of Israel, the defining story in the Old Testament about the children of Israel is God taking them out of slavery in Egypt at the Passover and the blood of the lamb on the doorpost by which they were forgiven, the gift of God. There it is in the Old Testament. The harbinger of Christ, the ultimate sacrifice for sin, the Passover. God delivering them out of slavery into fullness of their identity, who they were intended to be. And then as the people of God, the Israelites, the nation of Israel, was to be the living embodiment to the whole world of what God wants for all people. And that's why when you look at the prophets, you see that there's these words foretelling that what was given to Israel would be given to all the people. And most of us here today are probably not Jewish, maybe some of us, but most of us are Gentiles, non-Jews. We are a fulfillment of this, this gift of God, this redemption, this deliverance through the blood of Jesus, the ultimate sacrifice. And what does that lead to? What does it say? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. We all need forgiveness. It's the gift of God in accordance with the riches of God that he lavished, verse 8. And he, Paul, again, you just listen to the language. He lavished this on us. He just longs to give us this gift. He lavishes this on us with all wisdom and understanding. Verse 9 it says, He made known to us the mystery of his will. This was the eternal secret. Have you ever been let on on a secret and felt special? Like somebody said, hey, I got a secret I want to tell you. Because you're important to me. Well, this, the will of God in Christ, and what God did in Jesus was the mystery of God. And we've been let in on that. And what's amazing is God's now saying to all people, I want all people to be let in on this great mystery of what God does, how he lavishes his grace, his redemption, his forgiveness on all people. And then again, he says, according to his good pleasure. Again, Paul's repeating himself. God wants us to experience these things. God finds pleasure in this. And then he says, verse 9, he said, or or excuse me, verse 10. And this is important. This is a really important verse for us to not miss. It says to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment. When did the times reach their fulfillment? When did the times reach their fulfillment? Anybody? When? I I can't really hear you. (laughs) When Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead, that's when the times reach their fulfillment. That's why we have access to all the spiritual blessings in Christ today. And I want to be, I want to experience as much of that freedom and forgiveness and deliverance and release from the things that I still am too often oppressed by and misled by and deceived by these things we carry from our our childhood and our even those who went before us our ancestors that generational sin that we inherit that that does create this burden and oppression upon our soul and and causes us to be mean and angry and bitter and impatient and selfish and all these things that we don't even want to be and, and In Christ, what we celebrate today, what we celebrate in the season of Easter, God says, it's, as I said, it's all finished. I've done the work for you. It's not you doing the work for yourself. It's you just simply opening yourself and receiving and being honest. Be honest with yourself about the things in you that are not of God. Confess them. Bring them to God. 
So God can set you free. And that's why pride is the sin God hates most, because we get stuck in our agenda, in our arrogance, in our self-will, in our way that we're comfortable doing things, and we just go round that block over and over and over, and it's that craziness you hear about in the 12 steps, that the def definition of insanity is when you do the same thing over and over, and you hope to get some different result. It will never happen. The only way we're gonna get a new result is when we actually let God reveal to us that which is not of God, and we humbly bring it to God, and then God can set us free. That's the only way. And so it, it reaches fulfillment in Christ, but it's to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth and under Christ, and the def one of the defining characteristics of being in Christ is that we live in unity not only with God, not only with ourselves, but with everybody. We are peacemakers. We are always seeking to bring the peace of Jesus wherever we go. How are you doing with that? How are you extending the grace and forgiveness of Christ in your life, in your relationships? Or are you carrying things nursing hurts, waiting for the other person to get it right and come and confess to you. You know what? That may never happen. That's why some people go through their whole life carrying bitterness, even Christians, going to heaven, saved by grace, but experiencing hell on earth. God wants us to experience heaven on earth. And so as we receive these gifts, we're, God wants us to then freely give them away so that we are set free and that we become that bridge to others that others might be set free. And I don't know your history. I don't, I'm just learning the history of this church, all that's happened, hurts, disappointments, whatever. God wants to set you free. God wants to set this church free. God wants there to be complete freedom in Christ so that God can do amazing things in your life, through your life, through this church. I said it last week. I'm saying it again. That's the will of God for you and for this church. And God can do it. God wants to do it. It's according to God's good pleasure. What Paul's saying, it's God's longing. But God can only do that in our lives and in this church to the extent that we are truly willing to be honest and open and responsive to the invitations of God in Christ. Unity. That's why Psalm 133 says, where there's unity in relationships, that's a clear sign that that's where the blessing of God is. Where there's disunity and discord in relationships, whether it's in a marriage, in a home, with children, in a church, wherever you have people, where there's disunity, that's a clear sign that God's blessing, God's movement is absent. God's not free. God's being pushed out. So let's let God in. Let's let God bring healing and unity in our lives where it's needed. And I just want to get through this last section because it's, it's really just a quick repetition. Verse 11, in him we were also chosen. Again, this idea that God makes it possible having been predestined again, that repetition, predestined according to God's plan, who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of His will. God is the one that does this. Verse 12, in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ, here it comes, might be for the praise of His glory. And then, now this is where He brings us all in, the whole world. Verse 13, you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed. So have you believed in the message of the life, death, resurrection of Jesus? If you have, you've been included. You are included for all eternity. And all the gifts of God, all the gifts that are available in the spiritual realms of God, they're available to you to the extent you'll open yourselves to them and let God bring those to you so it says, you were included in Christ when you heard, you believed. 
You were marked in him with a seal. It's like God's branding. You were branded with the Spirit. It's like a tattoo. You're owned by God. You're possessed by God. And that's God's greatest desire for all, that God be able to possess us. But the only way God can possess us and give us what we were made for is when we believe and we receive the gifts of God. So that's my prayer for us, that we will let the Holy Spirit reveal what's true, that spirit that lives in us, lead us into that which is more true, so that as it says, that we who are his possession, that last phrase, those who are God's possession, that, this, that our lives would become to the glory of his praise, that our lives would be a blessing not only to ourselves, not only to other people, not only to this community, but to God. That our life would be a life that makes God laugh with joy. That's my, look at my son, look at my daughter. Look at how they're letting me transform them. Receive the blessing of God that's taken at the very, the very center of Ephesians. It's that culmination of praise out of which everything flows. It's the great promise of God, the great promise keeper. Receive this blessing to God, who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine. Through the power according to His power, His power in Christ Jesus. It's His work, not ours. According to His power. In the church and in Christ Jesus, both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.